This is a crusade. This is a holy war against the deep state. Where are the dictators? Where are the strong men? Donald Trump is our instrument for retribution. I'm going to fight for Christians. I'm going to fight for white people. They have the Great Reset. We have the Great Awakening. And why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because Which I am. I want to see these people go through misery because of their grooming against our children. After the assailant entered the home asking, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Those are the very same words used by the mob when they stormed the United States Capitol. I did nothing wrong. Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. Almost 10 years ago, a movement began. What started as a few gamers in the dark corners of the internet grew into a rallying cry that attracted all manner of people who were dissatisfied with the direction of society. People like Steve Bannon, Milo Yiannopoulos, and Mike Thernovic saw the energy in this movement and managed to harness it to help elect a president. On this episode of the Did Nothing Wrong pod, I'm joined by Mike Centers to discuss the ongoing repercussions of what became known as Gamergate. Stick around. Mike, welcome back to Did Nothing Wrong. It's great to have you here again. Hey, thanks for having me back. Always good to be on here and happy to be chatting with you today. So this week in San Francisco, a man named David DePape was convicted of assault and attempted kidnapping. You may remember him as the guy who broke into Nancy Pelosi's home and assaulted her husband, Paul Pelosi, with a hammer. The trial was pretty short. There weren't a whole lot of questions about what happened. The evidence at trial established that weeks before the attack, DePape of Richmond, California, targeted Nancy Pelosi, who was then Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, and collected personal information about her, including her home address. He kept this information in a computer file that he labeled Favorite Politicians. DePape intended to kidnap the then Speaker, hold her hostage, and break her kneecaps. As it turned out, she wasn't home, so he decided to take her husband hostage instead. Now, we covered this extensively on the show at the time, and we'll link our coverage in the show notes. Upon digging into DePape's life and background, one thing that became very obvious to us right away was that he had been marinating in the toxic swamp of online conspiracies, and his own blogs and writings state that the seminal event was something called Gamergate. DePape himself argued at his trial this week that online searches for video game tips ended up serving as his inadvertent introduction to a rabbit hole of far-right personalities and conspiratorial thought. He said that he had been looking up video game strategies and playthroughs on YouTube when he first encountered information about Gamergate, a nearly decade-old social media harassment campaign led by misogynistic male gamers who targeted and threatened violence against the women in the video game industry. He then began researching their many spurious claims about feminist media critic Anita Sarkeesian, which led him to discover additional targets. Quote, I'd look up a strategy to defeat a video game boss, and it'd be a totally different person, and these people would talk about how toxic Anita Sarkeesian is over and over and over, unquote, DePape said. I wanted to find out what was going on here. I wanted to get both sides of the story. So he branched out, expanded his horizons, decided to check out some of the people who the algorithm fed him, and he ended up in a really dark place. He told the jury he came across most of his newfound political ideas after listening to mostly right-wing political YouTubers for entire weekends at a time and a minimum of six hours a day on weekdays, including James Lindsay, Tim Poole, Jimmy Dore, Glenn Beck. He would listen to their screeds while playing muted video games for hours on end in the Richmond, California garage he lived in, which had no toilet, shower, or bed. So here's this guy. All accounts was seriously mentally ill for years, sitting alone in a garage just programming himself to become this weapon of vengeance against the people he perceived as being responsible for everything that was wrong with the world. And we almost got the Speaker of the House's husband killed as a result, all because of a campaign that was supposedly about ethics in video game journalism. So let's start at the beginning. Mike, what was Gamergate? Right. So Gamergate if we're being truthful, if we're being honest, it was a loosely organized, very misogynistic online harassment campaign that specifically focused on kind of quote unquote fighting back against the inclusion of feminist narratives, progressivism, progressive stories, LGBTQ inclusion, and general social justice themes in video games. The people who actually were a part of Gamergate would tell you that it was a campaign for 
ethics in game journalism, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that journalists were being bought off by social justice people and by progressives to report negatively about video games, to smear gamers, and to, you know, write them off as misogynist, as sexist, and all of this stuff that, you know, they were claiming they weren't. Uh, why they were organizing a harassment campaign that include death threats, that include threats to, you know, rape these women who were either games journalists, games critics, or game developers. And so it really depends on who you ask, right? The The reality, the truth of it is it's a harassment campaign, but the kind of reality that gamer gators lived in is it was this great crusade for ethics and game journalism, right? So depending on who you ask, but in terms of the rooted reality, you know, it was this really savage harassment campaign, which harassment campaigns had happened on the internet since as long as the internet existed, but it was the first one that really gained a lot of public traction. Right. And really kind of stepped outside of the bounds of being just about video games and moving into politics. Right. And a lot of people just to this day don't realize how seminal Gamergate was to the Trump campaign in 2016, all the way on up through the current information environment. And I personally think there's a case to be made that it's one of the most important political events of the decade, right up there with Occupy. Would you agree? I would agree with you. And in fact, I would say that Gamergate is the far right version of Occupy, right? Right. So Occupy was a response to, you know, the 08 financial collapse. It was this great moment of coming together of center left progressive, you know, left organizers attempting to fight back against kind of the excesses of capitalism that we had seen run amok and cause the 2008 crash. Right. Gamergate is the polar opposite of that, right? It took a fairly apolitical bunch of people, a bunch of young white guys whose main identity was that of gamers, right? They didn't care about politics. They didn't care about the economy as long as they could have enough money to play their video games. They didn't really care about what was going on outside of all that. This moment, Gamergate took them and flipped that political switch from off to on, right? All of a sudden, these people became very invested in politics because the core of their identity, being a gamer, right, was all of a sudden under attack. And the avenue of attack was politics, right? right? And so there was a response to kind of counter that attack. And we then see this community, this rhetoric get built up over time of, okay, we need to, like Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn, these are just symptoms of a greater disease, right? Right. Like, the real problem is progressive politics and liberal politics. So if we want to keep our gaming identity safe, we need to combat liberalism, right? And just so happens that Trump steps into the scene around the same time and acts as a, you know, vessel for these people to kind of latch on to after that. And they latch on to him hard, uh, as you were kind of mentioning, the whole online strategy of how Trump campaigned, Gamergate was the blueprint for that, right? Right. In terms of raging harassment campaigns, of calling people out, of sicking these groups of people onto targets, right? Of saying, hey, you're attacking Trump because you're a cultural Marxist, right? Yeah. You know, the cultural Marxist kind of conspiracy and that attack was one that emerged out of Gamergate as well. Right. And that's some phrasing that goes back quite a long ways to some of the earlier days of anti-Semitism. <laughs> but that was the first time I think in a lot of years that a lot of people had heard that phrase used. I remember myself the first time in about that time I'd heard somebody call somebody else a cultural Marxist. I was kind of like, wait a minute, what? What does that even actually mean? And right. Then you start digging and you're like, oh, that's not good. Where are you getting all of this? Yeah, and it's actually interesting that you say that, right? Because depending on which Google hole you fall down, right? Right. If you're a young teenager in your early 20s and you're experiencing Gamergate and you see someone calling someone else a cultural Marxist, 
you don't necessarily know what that means. And so you start asking around, you're like, well, what, what is a cultural Marxist? And if you get your information from Gamer Gators or your Google searches lead you down the far right rabbit hole, then all of a sudden you're going to be told that cultural Marxists are, you know, these people who have infiltrated academia, right? Right. And they're brainwashing and programming all of the youngsters to be progressive and communist, right? And mm -hmm. you might have this moment of like, oh, am I getting indoctrinated in my college courses or should I even go to college because there are all these cultural Marxists, right? So someone who was apolitical, who perhaps wasn't invested in all of this, depending on which way their Google searches sent them, depending on which YouTube videos they watch, you better believe that if they're asking people in the Gamergate sphere what YouTube videos they should watch to learn about cultural Marxism, they were sending them to people like Sargon of Akkad and Milo Yiannopoulos, right? Right. Who were very much pushing this alt-right, far-right rhetoric of these cultural Marxists are part of this vast web of conspiracy that controls every aspect of our life, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is just the Jews run everything, but with a different coat of paint. So Exactly, exactly. And you wouldn't necessarily know that, like you said, if this was the direction that you went with uh -huh. your Google searches. And it's interesting that you bring up, you know, Sargon of Akkad and, and Milo Yiannopoulos, because these are guys that later went on along with Ian Miles Chung and Mike Cernovich, other people who came up during that Gamergate and sort of came to national prominence. And then they came along as part of the Trump campaign, some of the big influencers online who were pushing Trump in 2016. So it almost seems in a lot of ways like they learned how to do what they did in 2016 during that 2014 oh, yeah. period of Gamergate. Absolutely. And I mean, one aspect of this, right, is we, we've mentioned Yiannopoulos, Sargon of Akkad, a lot of these alt-right kind of pundits, you could say. Right. But I mean, one person who took note of how well Gamer8 operated as a social movement and as an ability to rally people was Steve Bannon, right? Absolutely. He's been quoted multiple times as saying he kind of witnessed the untapped potential of kind of disassociated young white guys who were previously apolitical. Mm-hmm. He saw that as a potential avenue of a voting block, right? And not only did he see them as a potential voting block, he also took note of how effective their online tactics of harassment were in silencing opposition or even just getting awareness out there of an issue, right? And right. so Bannon took a lot of notes from Gamergate. And again, great book on this. Uh, I think we've used it before here for notes, Meme Wars is really, right. really good in talking about how the Trump campaign learned from Gamergate and specifically kind of politicized, not that Gamergate wasn't already political, but it took those aspects of Gamergate and really ramped it up to 11, right, right, in the Trump campaign of 2016. Because it seemed like Gamergate was explicitly political and explicitly pointed at a certain group and saying, well, it's all the progressives fault. It's all the liberals fault, but it wasn't necessarily giving those people like a vessel to, shall we say, do anything about it. It just seemed like it stoked rage, which it did very, very well. Right. But then when Trump comes along, it's like, okay, here's your solution. Here is your guy that is going to fix all of this. Here is your God emperor who's going to mm -hmm. give the liberals all helicopter rides for this. And you can see where these people got pointed in this direction. Mm -hmm. And one, one aspect that I actually kind of had a light bulb moment about this after the news about the pop came out specifically saying that like, yeah, I got radicalized through Gamergate. Um, when I was looking and thinking back on Gamergate and specifically how the rhetoric was tooled, like the rhetoric was tooled of saying that, hey, your identity as a gamer is under attack. Women and progressives and social justice warriors are coming into your place, taking your place, and like making video games not what you want them to be anymore. Right. And after kind of thinking about that, I realized, wait a minute, this is literally just baby's first great replacement theory, right? It's just <laughs> this, 
It's, right. It is. When you think about it, the stakes are just <laughs> yeah. a lot lower. They're a lot lower than anyone looking outside, but for like a gamer, the stakes were very high. Right, because this is such a part of your identity, being a gamer. Yeah. This is it's, huge. Yeah, it's the core. It's the crux of their identity. So the idea is, okay, look at the landscape of video games now. There are reports coming out that saying that 48% of gamers or people who identify themselves as gamers are women now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that there's more inclusion of LGBTQ characters and storylines in video games coming along. And there's this idea of the male, the white male core of what it means to be a gamer is, is being replaced, right? That is the rhetoric and the language that gets used. Right. And once you're in the far right milieu because of Gamergate, when then someone runs around and tells you, hey guy, remember how... SJWs were going to replace you as a gamer. <laughs> well, the Jews are going to replace you as being the core political constituent in your country, right? Yeah. It's the same rhetorical device. And so they're mm -hmm. pre primed to be able to easily accept that. They know that language game already. Absolutely. And so it's like, oh, yeah, my identity as a gamer was under attack. Now my identity as a white man is under attack. So. It's not very much of a leap at that point to get from there because you've already, like you said, been primed to accept the core concept that you are being replaced by something. And all you have to do is just play that out a little bit. And next thing you know, you've got the 2016 alt right. And it's amazing how seamlessly it worked. And the other thing that's amazing to me is that even some of the people who have benefited from this are still to this day kind of denying it. You've got, for instance, Tim Poole, who has been cited now in two of these incidents where somebody did violence as a result of their obsessive fandom of Tim Poole. Uh -huh. In May of this year, a man in Allen, Texas shot and killed eight people, injured seven in an outlet mall. As the SPLC reported at the time, the shooter had posted several screenshots of Poole's show, Timcast IRL, to X, a.k.a. Twitter. Poole has a history of platforming some of the worst people out there, racists, anti-Semites, other extremists, and he apparently found it funny that the Texas shooter liked his show. He is also known for baselessly accusing people of being pedophiles, which is another thing that came out a little bit of Gamergate, and... He has frequently downplayed it, stating, quote, they are obsessed with Gamergate, even though it hasn't been a thing in years. It's because the boogeyman means clicks. Rage gets clicks. They need a villain. They love Trump. And we all know it, unquote. So basically, Tim Pool is blaming the media when in reality, a large chunk of his audience, that's not really the case. So it looks like a lot of these guys are, shall we say, totally aware of what this is making some of their audience feel and do. And they're just laughing at it, winking at it, doing the haha, we're just kidding bit. Yes, yes. And it really seems like there's a lack of them wanting to take any level of self reflection. James Lindsay's response to all of this was, quote, IDK, who needs to hear this, but I denounce Dupape, lol, unquote. So it sounds like he's taking it really seriously and uh -huh. engaging in some serious, deep reflection about this, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So, I mean, part of the kind of far right milieu, the language game and the rhetoric is never taking the time to self-reflect, right? The, the idea of you can always use irony mm. or sarcasm as a mechanism of defense when people will accuse you of stochastic terrorism, right? Because, like, what, let's admit it. Like, the things that Poole, Lindsay, even back in the day, Sargon of Akkad and others said was stochastic terrorism, right? When mm -hmm. you whip someone up, when you say you are under attack, your identity, the crux of who you are, is under siege by insert whatever political, social boogeyman you want, People can only hear that so much before eventually someone is compelled to act, right? And you right. never need the mass majority of people to act. You only ever need one person to. And we see stuff like that happen with Allen, Texas, with Buffalo, New York, and specific, like the big one for me, constantly mm -hmm. the big one that I come back to is Christchurch. Yeah. 
Christ Church is where we see so much of what Gamergate started as really kind of explode, right? Right. In terms of him identifying as like a, a gamer, a white nationalist, a channer, the fact that so, if you read the New Zealand report that came out of that, the commission, you read some of the stuff that was written and etched on his bayonets that was on his person. So much of it is just soaked in meme culture from, from 4chan, from poll, from uh, the games board, and all of that emerged from Gamergate, right? You don't have right. any of that without Gamergate really becoming one of the key pillars of like the alt-right online identity post post 2014. Right. But if you ever confront anyone with that, if you ever go to someone and say, hey, Gamergate was one of the reasons why Christchurch happened, why Trump happened, a lot of these people will just kind of laugh and say, no, man, what are you talking about? Like, you're, Gamergate wasn't anything important. It hasn't been important. Why are you still talking about Gamergate in the year of our Lord 2023? Right? right, it's because most of them realize that that was their moment of political awakening, or that was a key moment in building their audience. Right, depending on if it's an individual or or a pundit or something like that, and they realize how absurd it is to say yes. So much of this atmosphere and milieu came out of this one moment on Fortune. Right, and this is a guy who decided as a result of these ideas that he had begun to believe in and the toxic stew of stuff that he had been marinating in to go shoot up a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, 51 people died as a result of this guy's embrace of these political beliefs. Nice. And like you said, it was very clear looking at the pictures that, you know, because he, he live streamed the attack mm -hmm. and it was very clear looking at what he was trying to achieve that this guy was a gamer. This guy had been influenced by not just the games he was playing, but the boards he was frequenting. And he had basically turned the whole thing into a live action first person shooter mm -hmm. to get rid of the people that he felt were the problem. And it, was chilling, I think, for you, for us, for a lot of people to see this and say, oh, my God, this thing just went very, very real uh -huh. in a lot of ways. This just went seriously kinetic. And we've seen it many times since in terms of the the actions that some of these people have taken. And yet the people who have the big platforms, the James Lindsay's, the Tim Pools, the you know Sargon of Akkad, these people deny that this was influential at all or that this had anything to do with what these people do. And it just, the evidence is just so clear that this was something that not only resonated then, but continues to resonate. It is. So let's talk about that, that whole gamer identity idea, the idea that so much of a part of these people's personality is wrapped up in the idea of being a gamer. How does that happen for somebody who isn't necessarily as up on this culture? Right. So the way I'll have to frame this is being a quote unquote gamer back in the early 2000s is pretty different from what it means to be a gamer now. Being a gamer, someone who plays a lot of games, is very normal these days. It's one of the highest grossing industries in the world at this point. Right. The early 2000s, it's still very much an upcoming thing. It's definitely got a lot of money behind it. It's becoming kind of more popular, kind of breaking out of the kind of nerdy sphere that it kind of originally formed in. But being a, a person who was kind of obsessed with video games, who played a lot of video games, you still fell within this kind of general nerdy outcast clique, right? If you're kind of in, in your younger age bracket still. Right. And so a lot of people who played games, be they male or female, back in the early 2000s, they tended to be kind of the the weirdos, kind of the weirdos, the social outcasts, the people who, you know, didn't make friends in person as easily as naturally. And so that's part of it, is you have the kind of loner mentality, the kind of socially awkward person who is able to connect with people facelessly online much easier than having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone. And then 
the crux of the Gamergate identity of what gamers assumed of what these young white men who would become Gamergators thought gaming identity was, was this kind of culture of very both blatant and non-blatant misogyny that had been encrusted in the American games industry since the 80s and 90s, right? Right. Specifically when like Doom and like the first person shooter genre first uh, began to come around, you had kind of rock star developers who came out of this. John Romero uh, was one of them and John Carmack. So like two of the really big names that kind of emerge within the early gamer sphere gamer culture are John Carmack and John Romero. Carmack makes Doom. Romero works on him with Doom. They do uh, Quake. They make a lot of the early first-person shooters, and then there's kind of a split. Romero makes his own company, does Deus Ex, does Daikatana. But both of these guys kind of flouted themselves as being kind of like ascended nerds of like dudes who like, you know, yeah, they were nerds and geeks when they were younger, but now they're really popular and cool. But they also had pretty misogynistic views on things, both either blatantly or non-blatantly. One of John Carmack's famous quotes about Doom and how Doom didn't have any sort of story. It was just right. it was just shooting. Like one of the most famous quotes about game development for the early period was story in Doom is like story in pornography. It's nice <laughs> to have it, but you don't need it, right? Like in, right. and you know, that's that's a bit of an inherently so that's this misogynistic kind of quote in and of itself, like to kind of imply that, hey, the only thing that matters here is the visceral gore, the right. action, right? Like the, the context surrounding it, that's just the nice extra stuff that can kind of be there, but isn't inherently important. One of the big things with John Romero was when he was making Daikatana, uh, his kind of big game, what he wanted to be his magnum opus. One of the things that was marketed, he took out like a big one page spread, I think in either... The New York Times or the Wall Street Journal is like one of the big magazines. It was just a one right. great spread that just said, John Romero is going to make you his bitch. And <laughs> like, those were the kind of two big founding fathers of American game development. Now, outside of like id and what came out of id, so the kind of the big first person shooting industry, you had like Japanese game development with like Nintendo and Sega doing its own thing. But like the crux of American game development those two are kind of considered the big kind of founding fathers that emerge after the big kind of game crash the atari crash right, right they're kind right. of considered the new founding fathers of video gaming in america and then from that you end up getting this culture of game conventions of game journalism that's dominated by guys because it's perceived as mostly guys playing these games Right. And then at a lot of these conventions, so E3 being the biggest one, you had this, what was known as booth babes, right? And right, so right. a lot of women dressing very scantily, hanging around the game, you know, booths, you know, talking to these young white game journalists. And, you know, there is a difference between a woman who wants to cosplay a character because she cares a lot about that character. And yeah, maybe that character is somewhat skimpily clothed right versus paying someone to be there not in character to you know literally just be sex appeal absolutely yeah, no different so. than what you would see at a car show or a gun mm -hmm. show or anything else exactly. it's the same thing mm -hmm. yeah and so that's one of the core kind of key tenets that gets built into all this is this idea of the male being the kind of consumer that is catered to you right the fact right. that if you're going to have a female protagonist, if you're going to have a female character, they need to be sexually attractive. They need to be kind of scantily clothed because you're appealing to that male gaze, to that, you know, male drive of sexuality, right? right. And that, along with the prevalence of, like, military tactical shooters that's coming up around the early, you know, the mid to late early 2000s, so, like, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, right? Sure, that sure. original trilogy is coming out in 2008 to 2011 to 2012 is when those three games are coming out. And that is a big 
blockbuster moment, right? Uh huh. Where like the multiplayer that kind of started coming up with Halo becomes really, really popular and everyone's playing COD, right? Right. I can speak to this when I was in high school. I played a lot of Halo with my nerdy friends back when Halo first came out. But by the time I was a junior or senior in high school, when Modern Warfare 2 was coming out, I knew dudes in the football team and the lacrosse team who, like, they were playing COD, right? Like, hmm. they might have never been caught dead playing Halo. Right. You know, the only video games they played before were probably Madden, but... Call of Duty's a thing now? Oh, yeah, like, after football practice, let's go play COD. Like, that is how I managed to, like, make connections outside of, like, the nerdy band circle I was in was because, oh, yeah, dude, like, let's play COD after the game. Right. But that sort of game, like, the the tactical shooter, right, that Mm -hmm. was another part of that mentality of the military aesthetic of, of violence being the solution. Right. And I think it's also worth mentioning that you're looking at, Six to seven years post 9-11. Uh-huh. You're looking at the time when we've got this generation that has been essentially marinating in war propaganda. And I'm here to tell you that was a really weird time to be, you know, in your mid-20s. When have... you are seeing all of this and you're just like, no, 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 no. You got to be kidding. This is the worst. This is a terrible idea. I can't believe we're going to do some of what we're going to do. But then you think of a generation that's behind you that hasn't necessarily learned that some of this stuff is a really bad idea and what they're starting to normalize. And all of a sudden, when they get to be middle school, high school, they get hit with these really cool video games that are very similar to what you're seeing in the news footage of the troops doing. Uh And you're kind of like, okay, this is another kind of way that people can be convinced that this is a super great idea to go off and do this kind of thing. And I think that, it sort of almost directly ties in with this rise in violence and misogyny to some extent that came along after these games sort of had some time to marinate with people. It's really fascinating to me that that was the case. And looking back, it's like, oh boy, this was not, this was not great. This was really, really not great. So these games came out. This was something that had some time to, kind of build and percolate a little bit and then come 2013 2014 the world's kind of in a different place by then Uh obama's been president for a couple years we're starting to see people making more of an effort to be inclusive and to try and realize that not everybody is a white male not everybody has that sort of view not everybody has that frame of reference And like you said, video games are starting to become a really big thing now. Mm -hmm. They're not fringe anymore. These people are making millions upon millions of dollars out of a big game release. They're being at least as popular as movies in a lot of cases. And the video game industry, they're not idiots. They're going to figure this out, that there's a lot of people starting to play them that aren't necessarily the stereotypes that they've been catering to for a number of years. So... It kind of strikes me as, yeah, that's where the perfect storm started, that they got some pushback when they started trying to include some of these kinds of people. How did how did that happen in terms of being able to the video game industry making that shift and realizing that some of their some of their players weren't necessarily all just like straight white men anymore? Right. So part of that does come from also the the creation of like YouTube becoming a popular platform, right? Right. So as as YouTube kind of emerges as this popular platform, as as streaming kind of starts to take off around that time, it doesn't really start to get big until a couple of years later. But as YouTube becomes a popular platform, it becomes clear that like, hey, like there are a lot of like female gamers and people who aren't white that play these games, right? Because they're making YouTube right. videos about playing the games they love and about what they want to see, you know, in video games more. And in fact, like the big, you know, one of the big boogeymen uh, around Gamergate is Anita Sarkeesian and her like critiques of like video games as a whole. And like her critiques, when you look at them, are like very banal. They're things like, hey, maybe there should be less sexist portrayals of women in video games. Maybe Mm. there can be like an actual empowering female protagonist that isn't also like eye candy at the same time. Like they're, they're pretty banal statements. And for whatever the reason, People latched onto those statements as being like, hey, you're assaulting the, the, the core and the crux of, of my identity in a way that 
never really happened before. So one actual interesting thing that I stumbled across that I kind of remembered as I was doing some research for, for talking to you today was when there was some controversy surrounding a uh, Bioshock Infinity. So this was a really big, um, really big first person shooter in the Bioshock series that came out in 2013, very popular game, very well received. So this is about a year before Gamergate kind of really kicks off. There was an argument being made in certain online spheres that Bioshock Infinite was anti-white. Mm. That you were running around, that you were killing a lot of white people, and that you, you know, that the whole political framing of the narrative was anti-white, but you weren't seeing these arguments on, on 4chan. You weren't seeing them on poll. You weren't seeing them on like the video game thread, like the video game board pre Gamergate was really resistant to political arguments being made on it. It was like, Hey, we don't want any of that garbage here. Like we're here to talk about graphics and gameplay. Right. Right. That was kind of the two main cruxes of it. Those arguments of the game being anti-white, those were all being made on Stormfront. <sighs> so that leaked out, and a couple of game journalism outlets got a hold of that, and they ran articles saying, like, yeah, man, people on Stormfront are making arguments that Bioshock Infinite is anti-white. And that made the rounds kind of on some boards and Reddit, and, like, people legitimately thought people on Stormfront were unhinged for thinking that. Mm-hmm. And yet now, like, a bunch of gamers would look at that and be like, yeah, of course, Bioshock Infinite was anti-white. <laughs> or they, they would be more willing to just openly have a debate about it rather than laughing it off. Right. And so it's, it's interesting to see that there was this argument being made on Stormfront in 2013. And then just a year after, we have Gamergate. So, like, part of my, like, tinfoil hat is, like, what if someone noticed that you know, there were a lot of gamers on Stormfront maybe talking about this because this was the only place they felt like they could talk about it. And someone thought, well, what if we can take this conversation and move it to a more public form in some way, shape, or form? Right. Because someone was making the connection of, hey, a lot of the unhinged people on Stormfront are people who really like video games. So maybe we can do something with that. Right. Whether or not that would actually occurred it was or if it was more organic you know i can't really say but it is interesting to see that that kind of controversy with stormfront and bioshock is happening just about a year before gamergate really kicks off yeah and considering where it went after that i don't think it's that much of a stretch to say that hey maybe some of these people who are posting on a white supremacist bulletin board and you know for those of you who don't know that's exactly what stormfront is they are the og white supremacist bulletin board don black started that back in the late 90s i believe it and is. as a result anybody who's been posting over there for quite some time has a lot of the background and ideas that would have definitely gotten you to let's turn this argument about quote unquote ethics and video game journalism into great replacement volume two. Mm -hmm. They absolutely are familiar with that particular theory. And it really feels like we're going to keep seeing the results of this. We're going to keep seeing the trickle down from this event from Gamergate, as long as, you know, people like David DePape find this stuff to, you know, kind of stumble across, uh -huh. as he said, and try and turn it into whatever they see as their particular version of the truth, the conspiracy culture. How, this is a tough question. Uh -huh. How do those of us who are on the other side of all of this counter program, counter message, this kind of stuff, do you think? What's the best and most effective way to to talk about this so people don't necessarily think it's such a great thing. Right. So first, I think there needs to be a very broad acknowledgement by everyone who's like not a far-right extremist that Gamergate was a seminal moment, right? I think a lot of people who study extremism do acknowledge that. They acknowledge that like, yeah, this was a pretty important moment where a lot of people got radicalized. 
but there are also people who, who look at Gamergate and just kind of shrug their shoulders and laugh. And they're just like, yeah, no, not really. It was like a harassment campaign. Like, what are you talking about? Trying to make, you know, the, the crux of why people moved to the far right being this issue about video games, right? It's, it's, it has to be about more, right? And like baked into Gamergate, there is the more, right? There's right. the racism, there's the misogyny, uh, there's the bigotry. But it's housed, it's cruxed, it's contained within that gamer identity. And like, you can't just laugh that away. You can't just say like, no. oh no, this wasn't really a big deal. So first is a general acceptance among all people who kind of work in this field and who are, you know, kind of center left to kind of acknowledge that like, yeah, Gamergate was the kind of political radicalizing awakening moment for a lot of what we're seeing now. Like, there's a good chance you do not have Trump in at least the iteration that we got him in 2016 beyond without Gamergate being a thing, right? Like, yes, there are other aspects that go into that, but Gamergate's one of the important cruxes, important kind of hinges that gets Trump 2016 being what it is. So there's that. Two is... In terms of trying to reach some of these people who might be starting to go down these pipelines is to, I talked about this kind of last episode is I was on, is to connect with them, like where they are outside of the politics that surrounds everything. So you need to be able to create an honest connection with a person through your language and your rhetoric through like a shared hobby. And so specifically right. talking about them like with video games, because there's a lot about the AAA video game industry that you can kind of rightfully attack it on, right? Like loot boxes were a thing for a really long time that continued to be a thing that are predatory in terms of monetization, right? The fact sure. that games are coming out uh, in unpolished, unfinished states that we're still shelling 60 to $70 out for, and then, oh, we'll fix it later. You've got a day one patch that's like five gigs that needs yeah. to be downloaded. Exactly. It's insane. Or you're, you're literally trying to patch the game as you go, right? Yeah the company releases it in clearly an unfinished state and gets it to where it needs to be later. You wouldn't do that with a movie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It would be very hard to do that with a movie. So <laughs> there's a lot that you can generally kind of come together with people across the broad spectrum of people who consider themselves to be gamers that you can kind of connect with Don to be like, yeah, buddy, like I hate having to buy a battle pass for like every game that I play that I want to like invest time in. Like I hate the fact that Cyberpunk, when it came out, was in an absolutely abysmal state, and it's great mm -hmm. now. I wish they would have just taken the extra year and a half to put in the dev time and get it to the polished state that like it's in now. Uh, there's a lot that you can kind of meaningfully connect with people on in terms of the, the salient issues, social, economic, within the gaming sphere that doesn't get into that sphere of like bigotry and sexism and all of that. And then... Once you've made that connection, if this person starts talking to you about, hey man, did you did you see this review? Like I, I think this I think there's too much LGBTQ content in the gaming industry now, you can have an honest conversation with them to be like, Well, where did you hear that from? Like, why are you saying that? And right. there's an ability to like you've already made that connection of like, yeah, we both really care about video games, right? We both play them a lot, we're both really kind of into it. So they know you're not coming at them from a place of bad faith when you legitimately critique them. And I feel like that's important because in the kind of online space, spaces and platforms that we're on constantly these days, right? Yeah. It's generally very easy to just assume that someone who's critiquing any point of your argument is coming at you from an area of bad faith, right? Oh, exactly. We've become so militant in how we perceive ourselves online and our online identities that anyone who doesn't believe what we believe is immediately trying to take us down, attack us, working against us. I like apples. Why do you hate yeah. oranges? Yeah, why do you hate oranges? That's a completely different conversation, right? And right. so being able to establish at least even a baseline kind of similar language and a similar rhetoric in terms of like, yeah, we both hate AAA video game companies because of you know, excessive monetization, right? Right, right? Assuming the person isn't already too far down the rabbit hole, 
then you might be able to have honest, earnest conversations with them about, well, why do you find this sort of sexist trope in this game to be like funny or good? Or why are you listening to this specific pundit who's feeding you things that yeah. are telling you that like, oh yeah, the game industry is out to get you, right? Like the SJWs rather are out to take over the game industry. And they've been saying that for the past, at this point, almost 10 years, right? Yeah. We're coming up on like the 10 year anniversary of Gamergate, which is wild right. to think about. Isn't it? <laughs> and so just being able to actually connect with somebody and then being able to, again, just have earnest conversations with them. That's hard because that takes emotional time and an investment to just get to one person, right? That's, that's to potentially prevent one person from going down further down a rabbit hole, right? Sure. And so I don't have an answer to how do we, you know, scale that up. I know how like we can each individually act when we kind of see someone going down that rabbit hole we can try right. and intervene for that individual person but in terms of scalability like that's the million dollar question right like i right. wish there was a way that you know we could a panacea that could just solve all this that we could put out on the internet and would fix things and there are some you know think tanks places out there that are doing good work on prevention uh peril at uh, American University right, uh, right. Is, is one of those places that's trying to do interventions, right? Or trying to figure out which interventions can work well to prevent extremism. And some of them work, some of them don't. But the only way we're going to kind of try and advance is to try things and see what works. And another important thing is to call out like when we're seeing things that are like really questionable and odd and like, why is that there? Uh, a recent kind of round of discourse that I saw on Twitter was there was a big anime convention that just happened in New York City, Anime NYC, second biggest anime convention uh, in the States behind Expo out in LA. There was a very heavy presence of the feds there. So apparently the FBI, the Marines, the Army, the Army Reserve, and I think the Navy all had booths there for recruitment, which is very funny because I went to that same convention just two years ago. And I cannot remember there being any of that there in terms of recruitment. And so people are like, well, why is the military all of a sudden at this big anime convention trying to supposedly recruit a bunch of weebs into the armed forces, right? Well, it's because that is the eventual like product of this kind of sphere of a fandom that we see online of like that has kind of anime otaku video games and the kind of like military-esque aesthetic stuff, right? Right. That all comes together to get a guy who like really likes anime, really likes video games, really likes the military culture. And then he walks into anime NYC and is like, oh yeah, I'm going to go talk to the army because there's a uh, Misato cosplayer from yeah. Evan Galleon that's there taking pictures. I'm going to be like Shinji. I'm going to someday pilot an Eva. Exactly. I'm going to go get the robot against mm -hmm. my will, right? Right. <laughs> well, and, and it's funny because a lot of anime, especially anime that kind of emerged in like the 80s and 90s, uh, is very anti war when you kind of like look at it, when you like delve into its like actual themes, like Gundam specifically is very anti-war in its messaging and its themes, mm -hmm. but it's outward aesthetic, right? It's very easy to be, to just take the outward aesthetic and be like giant fighting robots. Cool. I'm going to walk around this convention dressed as the space Nazis. Right. Right. And, and that's the other thing is some people were like very surprised that like, well, what, what's the military doing here? And it's like, I've been going to anime conventions for, at this point, over 10 years. And there have been dudes goose-stepping around in Xeon uniforms for as long as I've been going, right? Like, there's always been this undercurrent of some dudes, not everyone who goes to an anime convention, but at least a subset of these people who are, like, really into militarism. Like, really, really into militarism and nationalism, man. Right. And you can argue all you want about the themes of the anime and you're correct, but these people aren't there for the themes. They're there for the aesthetic. And that's how a lot of people end up in the far right as well. They may or may not be there for the actual racism, and sexism and bigotry, but they find a shared community in which they can partake in the same aesthetics, right? right. The same love of the video games, the same love of the anime without needing there to be deeper meanings, right? I just love the visceral violence and the visuals of the game and the anime rather than having to get into the nitty gritty of it all. Right. 
it's just that whole level of discourse is very funny. But there is a need to call out the recruitment there, right? Because they're tapping into this to this base of people who are predisposed to want to join up or sign up because they've been in this milieu of kind of fandom culture that pushes them that way. And there should be a pushback against the convention to say like, hey, maybe next year, don't let the Marines come in, right? Like maybe keep them out, even if they're offering you money to be on the floor. And that's a really hard thing to say no to for people like that, you know, because again, the money, the sense of what, don't you love your country, that Uh whole sense of recruitment. And that's like a whole separate kind of argument to say, should these people actually be allowed to be in this particular circumstance? And, but it's clear that they know that there's a pool of people that are accessible and pliable. Right. And that's why they keep trying to do it. Right. And I think there should kind of be added onto that, right? The reason we're also seeing that is because we've reached a generation of people in the armed forces who have been in the armed forces long enough that they were a part of those fandoms before they joined, before they enlisted, before they were commissioned, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, there's, this has always been a thing. There's always been this kind of connection between kind of, like, nerd culture and specifically a very specific type of nerd culture of, like, being really into the military, being really into guns, being really into, like, the specs of tanks and jets, that leads naturally into actually joining the military, right? Because it's just, oh, I'm just taking this sense of community that I have in this fandom space, and I'm doing the actual thing with people who are really passionate about this sort of thing. Because, again, I I think a lot of why people do things is because of their identity, but we like to kind of boil identity down to kind of like big ones, like sex, race, gender identity, when like, a lot of what really defines a person is the stuff that goes beyond that. Like, what are the things they're passionate about? Like, what sports teams are they really into? Like, what sports do they even like? Oh, yeah. And so, like, I think there needs to be kind of a greater understanding of that form of identity and why people act on that form of identity. And those identities can definitely be tied into those bigger ones, right? Oh, yeah. Like, the whole gaming identity that defined Gamergate was a white male identity, Um, But it was masked behind this kind of love of video games and like being able to look at scantily clad women in these video games. Right. 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 Not being critiqued for. It's interesting that you bring that up that, you know, identity sometimes is the smaller stuff rather so much than the bigger stuff. I mean, I've been doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu since 2005 and I have definitely met more than a few people who would make that sort of the primary piece of their identity for who they are that that's the first (laughs) thing they're going to tell you about it's like the old joke about how do you know when somebody does bjj oh don't worry they'll fucking tell you you know (laughs) and it is interesting to see that you can take a milieu like that and have a couple of the really big influencers start pushing certain ideas and watch it just catch absolute fire the Uh idea that a guy like joe rogan who comes out of that culture is one of us for better Uh or worse And all of a sudden he's interviewing guys like Chuck Johnson, like Stefan Molyneux, like Alex Jones. And you realize that, oh, these are some really, really bad ideas that are being accepted kind of uncritically by a lot of people who have already decided to take Joe Rogan seriously as a source of, you know, information. And you start seeing the idea of people who are sought of as gaming influencers kind of doing the same thing, Uh thinking specifically of guys like PewDiePie. And Uh you find yourself thinking like, we don't realize that this is so much of a form of like influence on these people because we don't realize how much of their identity is wrapped up in this. Uh So that's fascinating. The idea that it happens everywhere as well as that. It happens everywhere. And they're not like, you don't always hold this one at the same time, right? When you go beyond kind of the, the big identities that you can't really change, right? Right. Your race, your place of birth and origin, when you get into more of the identities that you define yourself based on the stuff that you interact with, those are interchangeable and you can put one on a pedestal more than the other based on circumstance, based on who you're talking to. Right. Yeah. And so I, I inherently know like not to lead off with the fact that I play a lot of hearts of iron four with <laughs> a, a normal person. Right. That'd be like, Hey, yeah, me, I've clocked about a thousand hours in that. 
versus like someone who I know is also really engaged in like a certain community. I can lead with that. I can joke about, you know, certain mods or sub mods. And it's like, okay, there's an established language, right? And so much of identity sure. goes back to whether you share a language with that person or not. And language here being more than just like English, Spanish, French, right? Like sure. the actual rhetoric and vocabulary that like in jokes and references, like that's language. That's kind of the activity and form. All your cultural signifiers, yep. all the yeah. stuff that you kind of have to be a little deep into the culture to get. Yep. It boils down to language and what I define as, as language games through like the Wittgenstein lens of my academic work. So yeah, it's it's really interesting to see that because I'm specifically thinking, we talked about VTubers a bit last time, about how there's some people who like, if you go to an anime convention, the first thing they'll let you know is like, yeah, this is my number one VTuber. I've, do I've donated this much money to them, right? They're decked out in that swag and they have like, right. like they're going to let you know. And like, that's something they would probably not be putting on a pedestal outside of the convention, right? Or at right. least I would, I, I would hope they wouldn't be. And then that then determines like, okay, well, if this person is really into this specific VTuber or this specific streamer, they're going to take whatever they say, whatever positions they hold on things, and they're going to like idolize those like, Oh yeah. And so, and that can be subtle or, or not subtle, right? The whole thing with PewDiePie was he was never like openly racist. He wasn't like ever on his stream, like saying, yeah, we need to go like, you know, put people in camps. I believe we should revoke civil rights for colored people. But he was always doing the edgy racist jokes here and there, right? Yeah. Paying the guy to hold up the sign about the Jews and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. It mm -hmm. was ha ha, tongue in cheek. I'm joking or am I? Maybe I'm joking. Yeah. I'm not sure, yeah. but. Until whether or not he's joking or not, whether or not he's being genuinely racist or just doing it for clicks, you then eventually get the Christchurch guy who you know, has subscribed to PewDiePie etched on his banner. And I believe he even says that when he, he starts says shooting. it right before yeah. he starts shooting. He starts shooting. Yeah. 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 And so it's like, at that point, whether or not he was being sarcastic or not, whether or not the shooter took him at his word or was also being ironic, right. That like, that all banishes, like none of that matters once it becomes nope. kinetic, right. Like once people start suffering and dying at that point it's like i don't care if you were being ironic if you're willing to shoot people over this you clearly believe it to a certain extent you mentioned it at a point where you were also mentioning things like great replacement knights templar <laughs> all of these other signifiers that were very important to you so your reasoning again is less important than the fact that you wanted to put it out there right and mm -hmm. you definitely wanted that out there for some reason the whole thing was staged that wasn't inadvertent yeah, and the fact that, like, there's, he made a manifesto, right? And the fact that, like, ever since then, whenever a shooting, a mass shooting happens, and specifically if there's an inkling that this person might be kind of in the far right milieu, we're always just waiting for the manifesto, right? Right. Because it's, it's become a staple. It's become part of that kind of language game of that identity of what it means to be kind of on the far right online, right? That if one of these people ever decides that they're going to go and shoot up a mosque or a synagogue, they've got to write a manifesto, right? And so many manifestos that have come out since then, uh, like the Buffalo Manifesto, I believe was, it wasn't like a word for word copy of the Christchurch Manifesto, right. but it, you could definitely see where it was like a blueprint, right? Oh, absolutely. And they use very similar memes and language. And, you know, you see him do things like, you know, spell people's names wrong in the uh -huh. Buffalo Manifesto. And it's like, is he doing that because he's ignorant or is he doing that because he wants you to Google them? And uh -huh. he knows that people are going to mock the fact that he spelled the name wrong. You know, uh -huh. didn't know how to spell Ted Kaczynski. He just wants you to Google, Google Ted, Ted Kaczynski, Kaczynski and Kaczynski. figure uh -huh. out why he might have mentioned that guy. Uh -huh. So... This has been interesting. This has been a really interesting discussion and some really good food for thought here on a lot of this kind of stuff. So I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for, thank you for coming on. Thank you for talking with me about this. I really appreciate it. No, that, that's again for having me, right? I'll be one of those guys who's on his soapbox forever saying we, we need to pay more attention to Gamergate, right? So I'm, I'm happy to find a bit of a kindred spirit in you. Definitely. Maybe for the 10 year anniversary of Gamergate, we'll finally get serious about actually analyzing it and trying to figure out really what the impact was and what it all meant. So maybe crossing fingers, fingers crossed. Yeah. But thanks again for having me. I enjoy being on. No problem. Thanks for coming on, Mike. We appreciate it. And you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Nice to see you. Take care. 
Thanks for listening to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can find us on the web at didnothingwrongpod.com. Please make sure you subscribe to get our content straight into your inbox. You can also follow us on Twitter at GrizzaBJJ, G-R-Z-A-B-J-J, as well as DNWPod. We're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that allow us to keep doing this important work. Thanks, and remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.